Good morning and welcome to a very bold blustery day in Carlton Corner. Uh, we are getting a late February preemptive spring storm so it's very very windy and lots of rain outside so you're going to hear that in the background. Today we are going to tackle putting buttons and buttonholes on the front of this frock coat. Uh, so we are going to be using the left uh, side proper to plot out the buttonholes. We are going to be using our buttonhole molds, which I have 10 of, to do the buttons in the front. I'm going to show you how I fabric cover these buttons. I'm also going to talk about death's head buttons of which I made my very first one yesterday and I'm going to put a link up to uh, Gina B's um, death head button tutorial at some point because she gave the best description of how to wrap these buttons. I need a lot more practice before this before I put them on a suit because I'm not entirely happy with my technique it got a little sloppy at the end, um, but I am going to discuss those. My name is Kelly Grant. I'm owner of Sweet Shoe Historical Clothing, and today I am discussing buttons and buttonholes. Okay, so I have my left side proper. Tool I'm going to need is a metric measuring tape. And it's easier to measure that curved front edge with a cloth measuring tape. I'm going to need my button molds. I've got 10 of them. The equation for plotting out buttonholes is you count your number of buttons, you remove one, you measure between your top and your bottom button and divide by the remaining number of buttons. So in this case, I have 10 buttonholes that I need to make. I'm going to measure between my top and my bottom, and I'm going to divide it by nine. So I'm going to plot my top button to be down from the seam allowance. So the seam allowance, yes, I'm flitting back and forth between metric and imperial. The seam allowance is a half an inch. And I want the button to sit so that it's not peeking up over that neck edge. So I am I am down a total of about four centimeters, but I'm also using my Mark One eyeball. So there's my half an inch. There's my buttonhole. There's a good bit of space between the the top of the button. And the seam allowance and I've made a little mark in chalk and I'm doing this in chalk so that I can erase it because I am terrible at math I'm going to then measure the curved edge of my front and I want the bottom buttonhole to roughly line up with the bottom or the top edge of my pocket flap And remember, I'm dividing my nine. All right, so my divisible number by nine works out to be an even 72. And I'm going to measure that curve. And come down here and put my mark at 72. And that gives me eight centimeters between each buttonhole. And I have to be careful not to creep my measuring tape. just broke. Made a big old mess. So 
So be careful not to creep your measuring tape along the, the cloth because then you could wind up with different measurements. I'm just going to make a tick at eight centimeters all the way down. So that I'm eight centimeters between each buttonhole. And there my ticks are. And because the buttonholes run with the grain, I'm then going to take my straight edge and mark my buttonholes on the grain line. So that they run parallel to one another and are on the straight of grain. button molds aside for now. And there's all my buttonholes plotted out onto my front. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to diagonally baste around each buttonhole through all of the layers. So the fashion layer, the interfacing layer, and the lining layer. Because I don't want the fabrics to shift at all while I'm working the buttonholes. I may also run a nice thread along that blue chalk line so that I have a permanent mark as I'm working the buttonholes because chalk mark disappears rather quickly. So I will be doing that next. All right, so I'm using just regular cotton sewing thread from the fabric store. No, I'm not wasting my good linen thread for basting because it's going to be pulled out. I'm also not waxing my thread because it will be pulled out. And I'm just gonna do my tack line for my buttonhole. So just a little back stitch there to start. And then go down to the next buttonhole.
And I'm going through all the layers with this. Giving it added stability. And even though I went a little long in my chalk lines, I'm only going as far with my basting line as that prick stitch that holds the interfacing in place. Because I don't want my buttonholes to go beyond that line. That one was getting a little crooked because my thread's too short. No need to thre play thread chicken. And now because I've marked all my buttonholes there with thread, I could brush off the chalk mark fairly easily, trying not to pull out my other basting as I go. It disappears really quite easily. And now diagonal based around the buttonhole. Back stitching to start and going through all of the layers. Now, the last two lines of basting we are going to do is going to mark the front edge and the back edge of our buttonhole. Now, there's my button. The center point to the outside edge, we want to be that far in from that front finished edge. So I'm just going to Take my button, start my thread, and everywhere I'm going to take a stitch, I'm going to line up that center line of the button with the thread.
And it may seem like there's a lot going on here with regards to basting, but you really want things to be firmly in place so that your buttonholes are easier to make. And you could certainly do these bastings in different colors so that you know which ones that you need to follow for later and which ones you can ignore. Like you could do the outside ones in black so you don't even see them. So there's the front edge of my buttonhole. Now, normally buttonholes are the width of the button, right? But in the 18th century, they're much longer. And very carefully, I can see the prick line of where I stitched my interfacing. And I don't want to go any further than that into the body of the jacket. Here's where I'm going to use my plastic ruler again. And I'm keeping my thumb, my thumbnail on the line that I want to use to line up with my front edge of my coat. There are lots of little measuring gadgets that you can use. There we are, all plotted out looking like a bit of a hot mess of static, but really the only line you're looking at is this one, that one, and that one. This one, that one, and that one. So I could make these in black thread and not see them at all. Next up, I'm going to do a buttonhole sample for you guys to have a look. I'm going to be doing it in white thread on or light thread on dark fabric so that you guys can see what I'm doing. So I have my sample here and you can see that I've done my outside basting in a darker thread because I don't really need to see it. And I've done the buttonhole placement lines in my white thread. 
I have a copy of my button mold and I'm going to lay that down to determine how much to cut for the buttonhole. Some of my buttonholes will be cut and other ones will be uncut and I'm going to use this sample to show you both because the back part of this buttonhole will not be cut and the front half will be cut. There's the front edge of my coat and I'm going to use a chisel to cut my buttonhole. It's the most accurate way of cutting the buttonhole and I'm going to line it up with that basting line. And it would be great if I had a bit larger buttonhole or buttonhole chisel. This is the largest one I have. And did it cut? No, it didn't cut at all. There we go. And move it a little bit further along. When you hear that crunch, huh? Yeah, when you hear that crunch, my, my chisels could be sharpened. I'm going to go back in and trim the cotton. There we go. My cut buttonhole. Now, normally I would use a black thread, but because I'm doing this buttonhole for your benefit, I'm going to use a light thread so you can see it. Give it a good waxing. in a good sewing needle that's still quite small but large enough for the thread to go through. I am going to knot my thread just to hold it in place. Okay, so my buttonhole is going to start way back here. I'm going to come in between the two layers of the cloth to my starting point. No needle there. It's in between the two layers of cloth. And I want my buttonholes to be quite small. And I'm going to go down and feel with this finger where the needle is going to go through, collecting all of the layers of fabric. Then I'm going to take 
the eye end of the thread and wrap it around the needle clockwise. And I'm going to pull in the direction that I want the knot to lie. And having a good thumbnail helps in this process because it acts as a sewing tool. So right next to that stitch, I'm going to take my second stitch. Wrap my stitch clockwise. I'm going to lay the two knots side by side. And again, being really careful that you're not going to creep in one direction or the other. All right, so now I am starting to get towards where the cut part is of the hole, and I can see that I did a really bad job cutting this buttonhole, but we'll make it work. It's the theory that you guys need to see. So there's the cut edge of my buttonhole, and if you needed to, depending on your fabric, you could whip around that buttonhole to hold the thing, the layers together. You could also lay a row of gimp if need be. If the fabric is fluffy, the gimp will hold it down. And you know what? If you're having a really hard time with making buttonholes, there are stitches on the sewing machine that you can use that you can base that buttonhole together nicely and give you a hard edge to work against and then go over it with the with the hand done buttonhole stitches if you're having a really hard time or if your fabric is is giving you grief okay so what i'm doing is i'm going straight down with the needle through all of the layers and coming up in the hole and I'm wrapping my thread, same stitch, but I'm being careful to go straight down through the layers and up in the hole. Straight down through the layers, up in the hole. And I'm collecting any loose threads that are hanging out there and you're probably wondering why I've made all of this stitching here outside of the actual hole well in the 18th century some buttonholes are decorative some buttonholes are working but they're all much longer than the actual button itself so the working part of this buttonhole will be open and be able to collect the button but 
the decorative part is going to hang out back here. And when I get to this, the end of this row, I'm going to work a bar tack before starting back across the bottom of the buttonhole. And like I said, that's where that thumbnail being a little bit longer and well manicured becomes a sewing tool. I'm laying my stitch down with the edge of my thumbnail. And don't feel bad if your buttonholes look like something that got chewed up. It takes practice. I've literally made a million of these stitches. I've probably made a million buttonholes. Um, and I still do samples. I do samples to see how the cloth is going to react when I cut it what type of thread that I want to use, what I'm going to need to do to the buttonhole to get it to be stable so that I can stitch it if I need to whip over the edge, if I need to lay a row of gimp. This particular thread I'm using is a Goodermans buttonhole twist. I've used silk, linen. I've even used silk embroidery floss if I wanted to get a really good color match. That cotton is being really fluffy. So there's my little buttonhole stitches. I'm going to go and do another little sample to see if I can take care of that fluffiness. See that fluffiness going on in the back there? that's not catching because it's fraying. So I'm gonna go do another sample and uh, I'll be right back. So here's my second sample. What I've done is by machine on a very short stitch length, it's 1.5, yeah. Um, I've stitched through all of the layers going around and that will give me a base to stitch the back end of my buttonhole stitch to and my middle of where my knots are going to lie are going to be right in the middle of that opening and then that's going to take care of any fuzzies that are on the back as well because that's pulling away quite 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 badly there now and I don't want that to happen on the main coat after I've gone through all the effort of making those buttonholes. So here I hope I can cut a better buttonhole opening. I'm going to make sure that I'm in the middle.
my chisels need to be sharpened. Well, that was a bad job too. Look at that. <laughs> Why you make samples? Well, I will do a couple holes of couple of knots of buttonhole stitch and see how it holds together. And I'm going to sharpen my chisels before I cut coat. Okay, so I'm going to come in outside of that starting point between the two layers. My knot's going to hang out there until I'm done with it. And I'm going in past that stitching line, right? And coming up in the hole. And that's holding up better. It's not going to be pretty on the back because I can't see the back when I'm working on it. that's going to hold together nicely. Okay, I'm going to do a couple more samples, um, but for now, I'm going to wind off that thread. Now, what do you do with that knot that's there? When you're done your buttonhole, you've gone all the way around and you've worked your bar tacks on either end, all of those knots can then just be cut off flush and the tail is in there, and there's a knot right there, so it's not going to undo. A few more samples, and then I'll start the coat. And this, folks, is why you do samples. So this sample is working up much better. The fluffiness is being contained on the back by that row of stitching going around the outside of the buttonhole it won't fray any further past that so those buttonhole stitches will hold it together much easier when i say samples this sample is exactly the same as the front of the frock coat so i have my layer of super fine you can see the layer of hair canvas that I've used as my interfacing and it's lined with the same cloth that the frock coat is lined with and I do sample so that I can determine how I'm going to work the buttonhole before I actually ruin the front of the coat and then have to redo the whole coat this is nothing this is this can be tossed away afterwards or it could be put in my sample book for later. But it's giving me a good idea of how I'm going to tackle those buttonholes. And also showing me that my tools needed to be sharpened because I couldn't cut a buttonhole to save my life this morning. Now, because I've done so many buttonholes, I can tackle them from both this direction and the other direction and I do it 
ambidextrous like depending on how my hand is holding up so you need to find a good comfortable stitching position to be in whether you tackle it from the away side and pull towards you or you tackle it from the near side and pull away from you it's the same stitch it's just depending on how your hand feels holding the coat okay so i've gotten to the end of the opening and now i'm going to work a bar tack and my thread is coming up in the hole so i'm going to go over to the opposite side and work a couple of bars across going through all of the layers and again I'm using my thumbnail as a sewing tool Now that I've worked a couple of bars, my preference is to work some buttonhole stitches over the bars to hold them together. You could also work a satin stitch over those bars. I'm being careful not to pick up my basting stitches. And I want my knots to all line up on the outside. So I'm pulling away and in the direction that I want the button, the knots to line up. Now, what do I do with this? I'm in the wrong spot. So I go down where I need to go down and I'm coming up in the hole. So I've tightened that nicely and now I'm ready to start laying in the other side of my buttonhole now I'm going to flip it over Because it's easier to hold the cloth in this direction than it is holding the whole front of your coat. That little bit of white is fluff from the interfacing that's going to be encased in the buttonhole knots. And remember, I'm going straight down with my needle, coming up in the buttonhole, wrapping my thread, and laying the knot in place.
So I've finished encasing my opening in buttonhole stitches. Now I'm going to go back into the non-cut portion. And the way that I do it is I work a similar buttonhole stitch. I tend to collect the knot from the other side in my stitch to hold them together. so that it's tying the two edges together. And don't be hesitant to, if you're finding that your buttonhole is getting pulled out of shape while you're working it, hit it with the iron and press it back into position. But there you can see those four or five stitches work together and the knots are encapsulated and that's going to hold that together. Once I get down to the end, I'm going to work another bar tack down here at the end and then my buttonhole will be finished. And if you can imagine all of that worked in the same thread color as the ground fabric, the fashion fabric, that would be a lovely buttonhole and everything would disappear entirely. Now, some of the buttonholes on this frock coat will be open like this, probably only one or two. The remaining seven or eight buttonholes will be completely uncut and just look like this the whole way around. They're just decorative. But that sample will help me to de determine what I want to do on the front of the frock coat. All right, so here is how I go about making my cloth covered buttons. Now, you can tell the difference between the right and the wrong side because the right side has a nap. So that's the wrong side of the fabric. There's my button mold and here is my process. Now I could very easily cut the circle and gather around and do the buttonhole with just the fabric. Um, some fabrics re require a little bit more stability though and um, when you're pulling as hard as you are on the fabric to make your covered buttons it's always a good idea to stabilize your fabric. And in period, they would have glued a bit of lesser fabric to the back of the fashion fabric that they're cutting the button from. Uh, I tend to use a bit of iron-on interfacing because it works the same way and I get a nice even appearance to the outside because the glue is an even layer. Now you can feel the beads of the iron-on glue that goes to the wrong side of the fashion fabric. I also tend to iron the interfacing down so that it doesn't stick to the bottom of my iron. I'm going to move my plastic bits and my wax out of the way. Now, the trick with iron-on interfacing is you can't just press it down and expect it to hold. It's a process. And you're going to steam it and press. And when you think you've pressed enough, press some more.
And my iron is making full contact with the fabric and the board. And I'm putting a bit of weight behind it too. There, now that should be nice and well adhered. Yeah, I can tell from the way that it looks. You can't see any of the beads through anymore. You can't feel them. All right, so you need to make a circle that is as big as your button mold plus half again. And you want that half again to be able to meet the center when you draw up your gathering stitch. Now, here's a pro tip. I'm going to cut two. And I'm cutting two so that I can use one as a sample and one as a pattern. If the sample works, then that's a good pattern. If the sample needs to be trimmed back, I can trim back the pattern as well and use that to cut the rest of my circles. If it's too small, I haven't wasted some very expensive cloth. And yeah, I'm using the scraps, but um, it's still expensive cloth and I don't want to be wasting it. Now, in a perfect world, you would use the same color thread as your fashion fabric. But I'm using my beige thread so you can see it. And I'm using a buttonhole twist. It's a nice strong thread. You're going to be pulling this. Making a good knot and leaving a bit of a tail. Around the outside edge, I'm going to do a running stitch and I'm going through both layers quite evenly. This iron-on interfacing method also works if you're working with a twill fabric because the twill will unweave itself and it gives you a nice cut edge, more stability. Or if you need to build up bulk up your fabric it'll help that too you could add more la layers than just the one there we are back at the beginning i'm going to take my thumbnail and put my tail down in the button 
I'm going to then put the domed side of the button down because I want the domed side up when the button is done. And I'm putting the button mold in the center and drawing those gathering stitches up. Now, here's where things get fussy. You're going to go inside on the opposite side, past your stitching, and come up. And then you're going to go across and inside, past your stitching, and come up. And pulling tightly. And you're going to go around the entire button, pulling up all of those humps. And now I've gotten all the way around. And that's nice and solid. And I'm going to go in the middle and make a knot or five to secure those threads. And at this point, I would also work a little bar tack going across so that I could stitch that button onto the garment. And then that's a beautiful little button. It's going to be solid and wear like iron for the duration of the coat's existence. And now I also know that this circle works and I can cut the rest of my buttons out. I'm just going to work my bar tack. And if you can imagine all of those threads done in black, you're not going to see them once it's done. There's my little buttonhole stitches over my bar tack. And then that'll hold the button on nicely. The last button I want to talk to you about is the death head button. And this is seen on a lot of men's suits as well. 
Um, I wanted to see how difficult it would be to make a death's head button. And I dug out my trusty book, which is okay. Uh, it's got some good information in it, but I am a visual learner. And so I went to YouTube. Um, Pierre will put the links somewhere that I followed. Um, <laughs> we found um, Gina B's tutorial to be really, really good, but then he went looking and found a few other ones that are as good as Gina's and do a slightly different wrapping technique. Um, it took me two hours to make this button and it is not the nicest looking. I need a lot more practice. Um, and as you can see, it's already starting to s disintegrate. Um, things that I noticed that will help with making your button stronger. Not only do you wax the button mold itself with your good old beeswax, give it a good coating. If your button mold is rough, that is also helpful. But also waxing your thread. And waxing it, but not pressing the thread. Leaving the wax to adhere to each other. And then at the end of your button construction, give it a press then to set the wax. But you can see that I was having a really good go of it for a while. And I will get back to where I was really good go of it. So you can see. This is going to get totally unwrapped anyway, so I don't mind. And it's one gigantic piece of thread. Um, so there we go. So I was having a really good go of it up until this point, and then things started to go south on me. So I have to practice a bit more to get past this point. Um, but because it's one continuous piece of thread, I could go back and undo it and redo it as much as I want to until I was happy with it. But yeah, um, I need more practice. So that's why I'm going to, for this suit, use a um, fabric covered button. Uh, I'll save the death's head for another time and another suit when I've had a lot more practice and no deadline. Okay, so that's everything that I wanted to talk about in this video. I will be probably spending the next couple of days working buttonholes until my hands hurt. Uh, if you liked it, hit the subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and don't forget to hit the dingly bell. They actually work when the upload is complete, even at 3 in the morning. <laughs> um, and... Stop by next time when I will be getting back to construction. We'll be putting the back together and then putting the whole body together and making it look like an actual coat instead of a bunch of just pieces. Have a great day.